many more fanatics than I thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome. And of 2014, many, many years ago, I, go, I went to high schools, essentially, and sometimes I had a few adult audiences, very rare. So I'm glad to, to start 2014 with an adult audience. <laughs> Welcome. Now. Sound is good. So, okay. Um, uh, well, I could just say, I, for all of you who don't know, uh, this is, uh, we have here tonight to speak to us, uh, re retired Professor Emeritus of French at Middlebury College, Simone Berenbaum. Uh, an old Vermonter, as he'd like to be introduced. <laughs> uh, um, and he's going to be talking tonight, as you know, about his experience uh, as a, a young, a young uh, as a boy in, uh, in occupied France and right. his experience with the, uh, during those times. So uh, please welcome uh, Simone Berenbaum. Thank you. Okay, now, um, I ask my young audiences to try and use their imagination. Well, I'll do that with you too. Please, try to imagine me at 14. No white hair, no mustache. I'm a boy wearing shorts like all French boys then. And this happens to be June 1940, and the Germans have entered Paris. And that's where th the story starts. Mm. Immediately, my parents stopped working. My parents were actors in the Jewish theater and were very well known by their public, and in fact, this is going to play a part in my story. But here they are, without work. And my father, I remember, started trying to find something. It wasn't easy, it wasn't easy at all. Now, the moment the Germans occupied France, I would say the first problem beca became the problem of just everyday living and everyday food disappeared. Long trains were going off to Germany, bringing the best things from France, best foods, best wines, and eventually best works of art. It is not surprising if the first group that started organizing against the German occupation were the French railroad workers, because they could see those trains going off every day. Now, I see a lady that is bringing a chair. <laughs> okay, now, where are we in this? As I said, we have everybody's problems plus the fact that my parents are not working. But pretty soon, the French police saw that we needed to be occupied in some sort of way, and they took care of us. All Jews had to come and register with the French police. Now, we said to ourselves, it's our police. They want us to register as Jews, all right. It's not the Germans, it's our French police. <laughs> we didn't know that the French police was going to be very busy. 
taking care of us in its own way. So men, women, children went in long lines and we registered. And of course the next step was identity cards because in Europe, if you're 15, 16, you have an identity card. Identity card stamp Jew. Then, of course, the star that you know about, I'm sure. Now, what are we going to do next? Well, what we're we going to do next is just trying to find ways to line up in queues, hoping that you would get maybe one day, if you were lucky, one morning, uh, you could get some uh, cream cheese. They called it cream cheese. It had already been worked on so that what you got was the ghost of cream cheese. But you brought that back home and it was wonderful. The fact also that uh, as a 14-year-old, I was a pretty good runner. That helped in some ways, because in the big central market called Les Halles, which doesn't exist anymore in Paris, that big central market, if you heard an announcement that maybe, maybe some morning there might be meat available, let's not say first quality meat, nor second quality meat, or possibly third you could make soup with. Because I ran, well, I would go and line up at six in the morning, and then they opened the al, and we ran to the pavilion that had meat. And if I was lucky, and because I ran well, I brought back some meat home. Now, if you had a bicycle, people started going to Normandy. So, from Paris to Normandy, it was a, a long ride, but they would go from farm to farm and buy whatever they could. Normandy was still a rich producing country. If you could bring back some butter, some eggs, some milk, uh, milk was a little more difficult to bring back on a bicycle, as you can imagine. Anyway, people went, but pretty soon uh, Jews could not have bicycles, nor could they have radios. So, <laughs> we tried to live on. And then, then a letter comes from the French police, the neighborhood police, addressed to my brother. I have not mentioned my brother yet. Um, my brother was seven years older than I was. So the letter is addressed to him and says, as all uh, young men, you have come to check with us and bring your identity papers and they give a place where the young men are supposed to go, and it's a gym, a neighborhood gym. And I remember the discussion between my brother and my father. My father is saying, this is very strange. Uh, we've already registered. We're on the list. We're wearing our stars. Our cards are stamped. What do they want to check? It doesn't make sense. And my brother says, Papa, <laughs> it's just pen pushers. They, they have a job to do. They got to show that they are busy, etc., etc. They say they want to check. Let them check. I have nothing to hide. And so, on that day, my brother goes up to that gym in our neighborhood with many other young men. And when the young men are in, the police surrounds the gym, and the young men don't come back. 
we have to wait several days and then we get a card saying your son is in a camp um, and they give us an address and they say and you are allowed to send them a package of food and a package of clothing every month. Now, what are we here? <laughs> I think it's a trick from the French police, probably. <laughs> okay. Now, France is divided in an occupied zone where the Germans are and a free zone, free zone, with a new government uh, directed by a man who had been a hero of World War I. Maréchal Pétain. Um, the Loire River, unfortunately, it does not clearly show on the map, but just imagine in the middle of France, our longest river, the Loire, which I recommend to you when you travel in the summer. It has a wonderful collection of Renaissance castles all along it. It's beautiful. Anyway, the Loire became the border between the occupied zone and the free zone. Orléans is one of the main cities, or maybe the most important city in this area. North of Orléans, two camps were established for the young men. And that's where we were supposed to send a package of food, a package of clothing every month. And I remind you, <laughs> my parents are not working. My parents start worrying about me. Young men taken first, maybe boys will be next. And my father I still don't know. I've had quite a few years to think about it and try to try this explanation or that explanation. I still do not know how my father got in touch with an organization of women called French Women Against Fascism. These women were trying in many, many ways to put sticks in the wheels of the French police and also of the Germans. And in this case, what they were trying to do, they were taking boys out of big cities and putting them somewhere in little villages in the countryside and so on where the police wouldn't come and bother them. So my father had contacted that organization and on a certain day, I was supposed to be at a railroad station in Paris, at a certain place in the railroad station, and there a woman would come and guide me somewhere. So on that morning, I have a rucksack, and for the first time, I have a student identity, identity card with a false name. That was my first experience with changing names. Um, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting at a certain place inside the railroad station. And a boy appears that I don't know. But he comes and stands almost next to me. He too apparently had been given information to come over and wait for a woman. She appears and she takes us onto a train and we go in the direction of Normandy. Now, the, uh, the station was, had quite a few policemen in it. But I guess they didn't pay much attention to a woman and two, two boys. But on the train, we had to be extra careful because we were going to Normandy 
where the Germans had started building a, a huge system of defenses, the famous Atlantic Wall. And uh, so they were really paying attention to wh whoever was coming into Normandy. And eventually, the police was replaced by a German police aboard the train. But again, again, maybe, maybe they didn't think that we look very dangerous, two boys and a woman. And she takes us to a small Normandy village where the only person who knew who we were was a young priest who was wonderful in many, many ways. He had a very good sense of humor and it helped because <laughs> Well, I'll come to that maybe. But at first, we were put to work in a farm, to live and work in a farm. Now, try and imagine uh, two boys, uh, 14, 15, coming from the city and working like men for this farmer. I mean, he had no idea that, you know, Parisians or what have you, we were two arms and legs and we were supposed to work. And uh, he worked us, no question about it. He, 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 wasn't, he wasn't impossible. That was his own life. And uh, he, he wanted us to share it. What we shared was a table of food that we had not seen for I don't know how long, as you can imagine. Uh, so we went on for some time. Um, but eventually, when we talked with the young priest, he said to us, well, how are you doing? We said, well, OK, we're learning, we're learning. But, but you know, when we finish the day, we're really tired. He said, I'm going to check around. Maybe, maybe I'll find you some farms where you will not have to work so hard. And he did. He did. And all that joking with us. Uh, joking because <laughs> there was in his, uh, among the ladies of his church, there was a rather old lady who, uh, she had antennae. And she sort of had guessed that these two boys were something else, uh, not, not exactly. But we, we had to go to church, of course, uh, in order not to, to shock people or, or have them ask questions. But she asked questions. And then she started working on converting us. Uh, <laughs> we mentioned it to the, to the young priest. <laughs> and I tell you, he said, oh, She's the one, he said, oh. And then he used the term about her. He called her a frog of holy water. <laughs> you know, these vasks where you have the holy water? He saw her as a frog, a frog right in the middle of it. Anyway, uh, he, he laughed it out. And, but he said, she might become dangerous. And that's another reason why I have to find a, maybe some other place for you, which he did. And um, I found myself with a sort of gentleman farmer who asked me to, to learn to make certain cheeses that are called cœur à la crème, oh. hearts with cream. Uh, and he said to, to me, you're going to learn how to make them. It will take you time in the beginning, but you will find that you go faster as time goes by. And then you'll have some free time. Come and use the books in my library. He was a gentleman farmer, really. Anyway, I was there and learned how to make those cœur à la crème. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I missed my parents. <laughs> I'd never been separated from my parents. You see, my brother wasn't so lucky because he was older. He would be put in, in a boarding school while I went with them 
And in fact, just before the war, they had been invited to play in London and took me along with them. And then put me into a school where no one spoke a word of French, but no one, neither the students nor the teachers, I had to learn English very fast. <laughs> and in my story, it will come in handy. Anyway, I miss my parents. I miss them very much. So I finally thank the farmer and thank the priest. We do have problems. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And so I thank the, I thank the priest, thank the farmer, who gave me a package of cheese and eggs and butter to take along home. And I was back in Paris. But in Paris, conditions had changed. You had to be extra careful and sort of keep listening because from time to time there'd be a rumor that maybe in a certain section of Paris the police might come and this time probably take the man. Several nights when we heard in our area that they might be coming, uh, we'd leave our apartment and go at the very top of our apartment house, uh, apartment's house, there were maids' rooms. No maids anymore there, but old furniture. And so we would go and spend the night in one of these rooms, thinking that maybe the police might come. Several nights, but eventually, they came and we had not heard anything. And they came for my father and threatened to break down the door if we didn't let them in and took my father away. And again, same thing, we had to wait. And then a card arrived saying that he was in a camp near Paris on the outskirts of Paris called Drancy. Uh, D-R-A-N-C-Y. Uh, it's going to play a part in the story. Um, and we were allowed, of course, to send him every month a package of food, a package of clothing. Now, the, that, the problem becomes much greater with two members of the family uh, away that we have to take care of. And who is going to do it? My mother, my mother essentially uh, was a star in the theater and was very, very well known. I think someone approached her knowing that her husband and her son were in camps and offered work. What kind of work? Well, the black market. The black market, you have to imagine a sort of pyramid with at the very top are the people who have the goods. At the bottom, the people who want to buy, provided they have money and you needed quite a bit of it. In between, you have go-betweens, people that will carry the goods to the people who want to pay. They offered a job to my mother in the black market, which was dangerous. I mean, you could carry goods and be stopped by the police and really get, go to jail for it, or, or possibly if you were a Jew, more than jail. Anyway, at that point, maybe women were not touched. Anyway, my, my mother took the job and she kept us alive, I would say. The three men, myself included. She also kept my morale up. I was, I was an adolescent. I was, what, 14 when we started, 15, going in the direction of 16. Well, 
at that age, you've, life is not, uh, <laughs> how can I say, easy to go by, to, to travel through. Anyway, my mother kept us. I remember once, she asked me to, to do a job with her, it, of sorts. Chocolate had disappeared with all foods, needless to say. Sometimes, if you were very lucky, you could buy, it was fruit paste covered with a very thin layer of chocolate. That was called chocolate in the stores. Well, something happened, something almost uh, miraculous. A bunch of boxes, those beautiful oval boxes with impressionist paintings on the, on the lid, you know, and you open up and here is beautiful, beautiful and a great variety of chocolates, etc. I don't know how. Uh, several hundreds of those boxes came into Paris and went to one of the great luxury shops uh, on the Champs Elysees, on the f French Fifth Avenue. Um, and my mother says to me, come, we will get each one of us one of those. We got up very early in the morning and we walked from where we were about the center of Paris to the Champs Elysees. That's quite a walk. But we walked because we had to go there before the subway was ready to go in order to be first or among the first in, in line. And then we came out with those glorious boxes and my mother opens both of them, takes one chocolate here, one chocolate there and says, that's for you, and takes them to the black market, of course. All right, now, what's left? That what's left is uh, essentially um, women, children, old people, sick people. The Paris police gets instructions to pick up Everybody, on July 16th, 1942, by that time I'm 16. Um, tell you something, uh, I found out much later, much, much later, I found out when I was in the United States uh, what I'm, I'm going to tell you about. It was a letter in le, the newspaper Le Monde, uh, which is the French New York Times. Um, there was a letter from a man, a young man, who had been about my age on, in July 1942. And that letter was addressed to his neighborhood policeman, which he wanted to thank. He was uh, celebrating the anniversary of that day. And he wanted to thank that policeman because that policeman had gone around the neighborhood and told the Jews that he knew, don't stay home tonight, we're coming to get you. So I want to start by saying there were policemen like that. But, but most of the policemen didn't give a damn they took orders and they picked up. I mean, it's one thing to pick up young men. It's another thing to pick up all older men. But to pick up women, children, old people and sick people and do it as a job. I don't know what one can say about that. I kept my French nationality, but it's not because of people like that. <laughs> anyway, um, they came and they took me and my mother. And in that 
misfortune, we had luck. Because most women and children and old people were taken over to a sort of stadium, a place where there were bicycle races. I remember as a student having gone to see some of these bike races. They were stuck in, in that place for, for three days or more and nights in conditions that were impossible. Uh, the place was not meant for that great number of people. It was hellish in many, many ways from everything I heard and everything I read. And recently there have been films made about that place called the Velodrome d'Hiver. Velodrome is a place where bicycle race and d'Hiver winter, winter Velodrome. Anyway, for some reason, we were not taken there. We were put on a bus, and we didn't even know about that until much later. Anyway, we put on a bus, and that bus takes us to Drancy, the camp where my father was. So at least there were three of us together sharing the situation of that camp. Um, this was not yet a concentration camp. It just was a, just was a camp. Uh, but with pretty bad conditions, very poor, bad food. Uh, I think I stayed a little over two months there. Um, I lost quite a bit of weight. <laughs> Why? Uh, very simply, because of the menu <laughs> that you can imagine. Bad coffee in the morning and a slice of bread. That's breakfast. Uh, then lunchtime, um, soup. Very bad vegetable soup. Um, but if you didn't eat it, what did you have? A cup of coffee at the end? Or maybe a slice of bread? A slice of bread, yes. Uh, supper, about the same as lunch. So you can understand why one would well lose weight. Um, but, oh, I, I did not add one thing. Arriving in Drancy, I was the only young min inmate there. I was the youngest. And I think the people all around, now try and imagine Drancy would be these three sides, uh, sort of huge apartment. It, it was meant to be an, an apartment complex for working people. Um, so here are the three sides. And out of windows, people were looking. And, and when they saw a kid uh, standing there alone, uh, there were very strong reactions. Eventually, other young people started coming in. And uh, what happened? is that the young people sort of, we regrouped. And what we say, we tried, uh, oh, I, should, uh, I should add immediately that uh, when we speak about a camp, we think of, you know, Germans in charge of, no, no, it's French police that were in charge of the Rancy. It's French police that were in charge of the two camps where the young men were. So if, when the young people regrouped a little bit, talk, joke, sing even, <laughs> because we, we belong to youth organizations and uh, we knew we had songs in common, so sometimes when we were in our corner, sometimes we sang just to keep morale up. Again, if the policemen were in a good mood, they, they let us be. And then something happened. Just 
two things happened. Drancy became a transit camp. You came to Drancy and you stayed a certain amount of time, but eventually they would call a list of names, the police would call a list of names, and the people on that list were put in a special enclosure at one part of the camp that was isolated. And you spent the night in that enclosure. The next morning you came down, they shaved your hair off, and you waited for trucks that were going to come, take you to a train, and the train took you east somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere. At that point we did not have yet the, the names that you, you know and you hear, Auschwitz and other places. So, we were all more or less badly off, but the, pers the people who were worse off were the people who were put in the special enclosure because they were cut off from communication with the rest of their friends. They, uh, they couldn't get the food, you know about the food now. They couldn't get the food that we all got because they now were put in that special place. Um, they were not allowed to use the latrines because it would, might have tried to hide and not be put on the trucks to go to the trains and so on. So once they were in that enclosure, they had to stay there. And uh, a man, an inmate of course, um, came up to the group of young people, our group, and he said, I've been watching you. I see what you're trying to do. I have a job to suggest to you. Maybe you could help the people who are put in the enclosure. You could bring messages from them to their friends in the camp and back. You could also carry some food to them because they're entitled to some food. And and he says, that part of the job is going to be the hard part. Since they cannot use the latrines, you may have to use, to wear, carry portable latrines for them to use and take them up and take them down. He said, that will be the difficult part. He said, but it's up to you. Why don't you talk about it and see? And we decided that yes, we wanted to be the volunteers in the Rancy. And we did our job. And then one day, when they called the list of names, my parents and I were on the list. And uh, so we were put in the enclosure. My friends came to say goodbye. Uh, we spent the night, <laughs> not a very good night as you can imagine. Um, next morning we're down and we're waiting. Sometimes you had to wait a long time for the trucks. So there we are waiting. Oh, I forget, of course. Before we wait, they shaved my father's hair off and, and then mine. And so we wait. Now after some time, I don't know how long, but after some time, we can hear someone calling a list of names. <laughs> we don't pay attention. I mean, after all, we've been selected already. But that person keeps reading the list, reading the list. Finally, my father says to that person, 
what is that list that you, that you are reading? And he says, oh, it's a list to be taken out of the camp and freed. Why? What happened? What was it? We, we, we got no explanation, but we didn't ask any questions. We were put on a bus and sent back to Paris. So now, what happened? It's complicated. Um, so, a little bit of history of the war. Um, the Germans and the, and the Russians had a pact of non-aggression. Now, some people have respect for pact, some people use it as a decoy. <laughs> and uh, the plan was for the Germans to prepare to attack Russia when they felt ready, which they did. And they penetrated deep into Russia. But resistance grew and uh, Russia did not capitulate, which meant that the Germans would have maybe a second year and a second Russian winter. And for the second Russian winter, they were ready to be prepared. They needed fur coats, fur boots, fur gloves, fur bonnets, and everything. It just so happens that in Paris, the people that make, that work with fur, a lot of these people are Jews. So they were told, if you work and make coats for us and boots and so on, you will get a protection card. You will not be sent off to camps and so on, to the, to the whole sea and elsewhere. Um, so a man says to the Germans, I can make coats for you and so on, but you've got to let, you've got to let my workers go, and you have some of our workers in your camps. And they say, give us a list. And he puts my parents and me on the list. The moment we're out, the moment we're back in Paris, my parents go to work for this man. Because if the Germans check, and find out that he played a trick on them, he'll pay. So they both work, and I, in fact, I learn to work on furs too. And I don't know if you have any experience about working on furs, but you've got, you've got a skin that you've got to pull, and uh, you pull it, and then you put a nail in, and, and with that same plier, you bang the nail. And boy, did I get my fingers banged, as you can imagine. But, but we worked, and we made sure that the man who saved us was not going to run into all sorts of trouble. OK, so a few months pass. And now the question is this. Once the Germans have enough coats, <laughs> what will they do with the protection cards? Shall we wait for that? Meanwhile, having come back out of the camp, I rejoined uh, the Jewish Boy Scouts in which I was a leader and found out that there was a cell, a unit of senior scouts who had a job they made false identity cards. Of course, you could buy false identity cards, but for a lot of money. We got three cards, free, of course, which meant also deciding where to go with those false identity cards. And uh, in the south of France, 
And the south of France, oh, oh, the map shows it, good, Toulon. <laughs> or is it? It's, it's just Toulon, yes. It, um, Toulon is a, a sort of military base and harbor in the south of France. A little inland from Toulon is a town called uh, Draguignan. And we had some friends there who had been corresponding with us and said that they were relatively safe. So this is where we decided to go, which meant leaving one valise with one valise each, a train station at night, and hoping for the best, knowing that at the line dividing the occupied from non-occupied zone, the train stops and German police come aboard and check identity papers. Now, we were hoping that our papers were well done. <laughs> but of course, one never knows, one never knows. And uh, so here we were on that train, um, hoping for the best and being more than worried. The train stops, and then something strange happens. Germans come on board, uh, we have taken out our papers, and they glance and pass. They had a job that night. We didn't know about the job they had. Their Italian allies were in trouble with American troops going up the boot, the Italian boot. And uh, Italian soldiers were dropping their uniforms, getting civilian clothes, and trying to get back to Italy. On that train, there maybe were some. Anyway, the Germans were, take, were going to take care of their allies, since their allies were going to give up on them. And they looked for them. Again, that was our second stroke of luck. No question about it. They didn't check our papers. So now we are in Draguignan. Draguignan, we resumed what could be called a normal life, but of course with false identity papers. I go back to school, to college, high school. Um, I've got to remember that my name is now Baudin, B-A-U-D-I-N, it's a, I think a deputy who died on the barricades. Um, anyway, that, that's me, Baudin. And I, f I forget sometimes, I'm in class, you know, that the teacher calls three, four names for some task, and the guy next to me said, Hey, Baudin, tu t'es appelé, he called you. I said, oh, oh, <laughs> yes, oui, présent. <laughs> anyway, um, th those were some of the lighter moments of our life. Uh, living in southern France uh, was uh, easier in some ways, because you had uh, better fruit and vegetables, especially now, of course, if you had any way to reach uh, people with oil, uh, with oil you could trade for practically anything, which we did not have. But anyway, anyway, the life, life was bear, quite bearable then. But uh, of course, we completely cut off from my brother. It is, we learned much later, much later, what happened. The camp, the two camps where the young men were, were sent east to make room for the women and children that came from that place I described to you. Once there, after some time, Small groups of children 
was sent off uh, under the guidance of one or two adults who were not perforce their parents. And needless to say, the separation from between mother and children was terrible. <coughs> Again, the French police uh, played a very spectacular part in, in those scenes. Anyway, the young man had been sent east, and we had no news until the end of the war. Okay, so now, now we're in southern France. We've got to be careful though, because still, the police is, uh, seems much more relaxed in Draguignan and around Draguignan <coughs> than, uh, than in Paris and surroundings. But a letter arrives from the police addressed to me saying all young men have to serve our allies. Who are the allies now? The Germans. They have now entered that zone. And now that they're They've entered it. They are beginning to build up defenses along the Mediterranean coast. And they want young men to do the work. And we have to do two weeks of work for the Germans. Now the question is, do I go or don't I go? Um, if I don't go, um, the police will come and check. And here we are with false identity papers, and we've been relatively quite and relatively uh, <laughs> out of danger. But I can't afford to get my parents to be in trouble because I don't want to go and serve two weeks the Germans. So I go. Now, I don't want you to imagine, you know, hard work conditions and so on and so forth. No, not at all, not at all. We're in a big field opening up practically on the sea. The air is wonderful. The sun is beautiful. This is southern France. Um, and what we have to do is we have to dig holes. And in those holes, put pine trunks side by side to become barriers against the gliders that the American may send, that the Americans may send uh, with weapons, uh, ammunition, supplies, etc., etc. Um, we're supposed to build something that would prevent or compel the Americans to land elsewhere. We're supposed to do that. That's what we're supposed to do. What we do is another story. <laughs> we work very slowly under the guidance of one old German on a bicycle. And he tours the field. And as he tours, people whistle, which means you start working as he approaches. But of course, the area is left, you drop whatever tools you were using anyway. So. <laughs> We did not work much. We did not do very much of the plan that the Germans was hoping we were going to do for them. Um, but there was a problem of food. They fed us decently. Of course, they were expecting work from us. They fed us, and decently too. But listen, under the Mediterranean sun, outdoors for hours and hours, Oh, we, we just needed some supplements. It happens to be that the cherries were in full production. So the best climber of the group with a big hat comes down and we all share the cherries, etc. And all of a sudden, 
someone says, oh, le fermier, the farmer. And the farmer is, appro is approaching. His clothes, face red, etc. And we start hemming and hawing and trying to explain that after all, you know, we were hungry. And uh, anyway, we will pay for the cherries. And he says, in his best southern French, oh, I don't give a damn for the cherries. The Americans have landed. This was June 6, 1944. <laughs> so there we were, rejoicing and sharing the cherries. Um, OK, now, <clears throat> if they have landed, they must land. They must land soon in our area. They are in, they are in North Africa. And they're coming up the Italian boots? I mean, they must. So it's just a question of time. And it comes in August. It comes, I remember that night, full of projectors trying to follow so many planes and so many paratroopers jumping down. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> like a dream come true, finally. Next morning, very early, I put on my Boy Scout khaki shirt, my Bo Boy Scout khaki shorts, and an armband, Red Cross, and I'm on my way. And my parents say, where are you going? And I say, look, I say, I'm sure that the town must have been liberated. Uh, I'll go down and see what I can do. I can carry messages. I can take care of people that are hurt because I had a scout formation, what have you. And my parents let me go. They, they said to me first, look, we have no news from your brother. Are you going to, to risk your life? I said, if I don't do it now, when? And they did let me go. And I come down into the Reguignon and I see my first guys with FFIs, French Forces of the Interior. It looks wonderful. And uh, I'm taken by one guy to another, to another, to another. And I land right in front of the chief of the resistance uh, of Draguignan, uh, Colonel Fontes. And uh, he says to, to me, hmm, is it true that you speak English? And I said, it's true. He says, you're a godsend. And I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I want to help. He says, you will help. But what you're going to have to do will wait for tonight. Then your mission is get in touch with the Americans and explain to them the situation. We have liberated the center of town, but the Germans are on the hill. We have guns. They have machine guns. Uh, we need help. So I say, OK, um, so when? He said, tonight. And he said, I'll give you, I'll give you a guy to go with you. So we meet at night, and our job is to find the Americans. The problem is we know that the paratroopers have landed all over, but where have they regrouped? We know that the, coming from the sea, the, the American troops that have landed will eventually be coming up in our direction. So what group do we meet first? We don't know. It's night. And we've got to be very careful because any time when we work, walk, any time we hear a motor, that means either a German, and in fact, there is a German motorcycle that too cruises around the town with a machine gun on the side of the motorcycle. Um, or it could be a Frenchman who works for the Germans and gets gas. So we've got to be very careful when we hear a motor. So we jump in the ditch. 
come out, walk again, again a ditch, <laughs> again we walk, etc. But uh, eventually, when I try to remember, I, I would like to say what I remember is the night walking. I mean, complete darkness, and yet there is a sense of movement. And what it was, two lines of paratroopers coming along the road. While we were going one way, they were coming <laughs> in our direction. Uh, camouflage, camouflage suits, and oil on their faces. You, you couldn't see, you, and yet you could feel the movement. So we say to them, Take me to your leader. <laughs> <laughs> a lieutenant, a young lieutenant, and he says, uh, what, what is happening in, in this, the town you come from? And we say, the Germans occupy the main position up there. And he said, can you guide us? And we said, we're there for that. So we spent the whole night just traveling great semicircle and until in the morning we're right above the, the German. And uh, the paratroopers take out of their rucksacks little mortars and start lobbing shots into the German camp. And that was the first mission. Since that time I had a few more missions uh, dealing with the paratroopers. Essentially they had dropped quite a few supplies. You remember, I told you about the gliders? Yes, their gliders had dropped a lot of supplies in the woods surrounding Draguignan, the town where I was hiding. And the job was, I, I had a paper with that, I could stop any vehicle, especially a truck, and we would go into the woods and pick up whatever supplies had been dropped there. So that was the job. And we even picked up a, a paratrooper lieutenant who was walking in the woods as in the days because he had jumped with his unit and they, they had been shot one by one by snipers. So he was the only one and he didn't dare uh, go to sleep in the woods. We picked him up, put him in, in, in the truck took him into Draguignan. Um, there was an hotel there. I remember the main hallway was lined with mattresses. He literally fell on a mattress and was gone. He was, <laughs> he was catching up whatever sleep he needed. Um, I was told that he came back several times to Draguignan. Um, he wanted to meet me again. Um, uh, by that time, I was gone. I was gone because we were finishing the job with the paratroopers. And uh, so I asked if there was something I could continue to do. And I was sent, I think it was Fontes, the, uh, the colonel, who said to me, there's an American unit that is going to go up the Rhone Valley. Uh, you could leave with them and be, act as a guide or go between. Anyway, that's the job, that's the job I took. And uh, I told you about one river, La Loire. But the Rhone comes down from uh, the Alps, straight down into the Mediterranean. And so we were following the Rhone and we were always the first American unit that was uh, getting there. And that was, my outfit was uh, 36th Division, Texas, I think. And behind us, we had the 45th Division. Uh, and the 45th Division pulled us out of a very bad spot because the Germans were trying very hard to get back to Germany especially some of their big units. So they, they, had, they had to come to the Rhone and either cross it or go beyond it. And 
they came up. And uh, while we were, whoop, sorry, while we were going up, they were coming from the southwest. And it was a big German tank unit uh, with the big tanks called the Tiger tanks. It has these, these tremendous guns. And we were a very light unit. And all we could do was lie down as low as possible where they shot over, over us. That was my baptism. And that's where I discovered that I wasn't the great hero that I, I could <laughs> pretend to be. Um, but uh, we had to, to wait one, two days uh, or more. And eventually, the 45th Division had tank destroyers. So they came and they took care of the dialogue with the Tiger tanks. <laughs> and then, so we continued. And we went up into the Alps, to the foot of the Alps, in the Alps, in fact, and found ourselves in a town called Briançon, which is a, a ski resort. Big hotels. And uh, around the, the valley, surrounding it are forts, where there used to be Italian soldiers, but they had left. But what we did not know is that a German unit, I don't know where they were coming from, but they were re-establishing them, themselves all around us while we were in the center of town. Uh, there were two map, two map rooms, the French map room and the American map room. The French had some information, apparently, that the Americans didn't have. And I was like a ping pong ball from one room to the other, <laughs> trying to show the Americans that, in fact, the Germans were going to surround us. And they finally decided, we got to get out of here. <laughs> because we were very lightly equipped. We were not going to deal with any big German group, and I think if I'm not mistaken, that German group came from very far. They were of, I think they were from the Africa Corps, the, the, big, the big group that had done, that had done very well and very badly uh, in North Africa. Anyway, we left in town, just in time, just in time. Uh, and then, that's when I decided that I had done, I had done my missions. Um, I had lost a year. I did not want to lose more. Um, there was, I discovered later, I think, that you could take the two final French exams that take two years, you could take them in one year if you had a good excuse, a good reason. And I thought I did. So, uh, so that's why I was coming down to Draguignan. Okay. And then, I resumed a normal life. But I discovered that where the two of us had met the Americans, there now was a little pyramid indicating here members of the underground met the first Americans. So I had a little monument, <laughs> but what I didn't know is my little monument moved, became bigger. I saw it in its second phase with my wife years later when we were traveling on a tandem bicycle for two um, along the Mediterranean. And she said to me, Draguignan, I see a sign, Draguignan, this is where you were hiding. And I said, yes. And she said, I want to see it. I said, yes, but you know, we're now by the Mediterranean. We'll have to climb all the way in the direction. She said, yes, let's do it. And I said, OK, you're going to see my little monument. And it had been, been replaced by a bigger one. <laughs> That's not the end of the story. There is now 
literally a wall, which is the final monument, and I, I, have, I have it here. I thought you would like to see it. There it is. But it's in French. So please pass it around. And now we, we try to resume a normal life while hoping as soon as possible to be able to get back to, to Paris. Um, but before we got back to Paris, an actor who came from Eastern Europe had he been in one of the camps? I'm not sure. But he came back with news. And the news he brought back was that the young man, I told you, had been sent east, my brother among them, and uh, Auschwitz was where he was sent and where he died. Uh, they had nicknamed him the light yeah. in the camp in in France he had organized he directed plays uh, they had uh, exhibits of uh, sketches paintings lectures and so on and so forth he was one of the organizers I think that why the reason why he got the name, the nickname, the light in Auschwitz is must he must have continued some of that work. I I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I have a photograph of him. It's a small one. He's standing in, a bar in front of the barracks, and he is, he is the tallest in the middle. And that's the story. We came back. We came back to Paris. Something had happened which was interesting. Um, in Paris, there was a new public. There were people who were waiting for visas. They were waiting for visas to Australia, to England, to the United States. So a new public was there, and my parents were able to start playing again, except that several of their actors had not come back. And they asked me if I could take a part. And I did play with them, and I think one or maybe two plays, not more, I think. Um, I was honored to have a chance to play with my parents. <laughs> Voila, as we say in French, <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> I'll be glad to answer questions uh, if I have answers and if I can hear your questions because my hearing is uh, about as old as I am. <laughs> yes? Yes, two unrelated things. The first is what happened to the furrier who saved your family? Very good question. Um, as far as I know, he continued he continued working in fur, but we, we of course, so thanked him. Thanked him a lot for what he had done. Yes, right. yes. And in fact, by working for him, we were in turn trying to protect him. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, I just want people to know, I, over 30 years I was in Provence every summer, and every summer on the 15th of August, 
people were so grateful to the Americans. You would see American flags in all the windows in these tiny little villages. And the sense of joy. And I would be greeted as Le Mexicain every, every summer. And they have never forgotten. In Draguignan, I think uh, on the outskirts of Draguignan, there is an American cemetery. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I had a note from, from the people there. Yes. You had a question, I think. Yes. Uh, what happened to your, your parents' apartment when you went south and when you came back north to Paris, were you able to go back to that home? That was surprising, but we were able to go back to our apartment. Uh, I must say that my parents, having been wanderers and having their first apartment just before the war, it was a very simple apartment, very basic, essentially. And one of the most important things were two big trunks that had their theater costumes yeah. in them. And I don't think that anybody would have wanted to steal, to steal that from them. Um, I also remember that my mother, that great actress, had her first kitchen a very small kitchen and she had to learn cooking because <laughs> as an actress uh, she would travel with a little oh it's a gas a, a gas burner a, a, that you she would cook with that the, the basic absolutely the basics but yes we we were lucky we we found everything except what we did not find is the artwork from my brother mm -hmm. because he he was a very he was a very gifted artist mm. i i don't even have a sketch by him mm. oh. any other oh yes how did you get to the united states and did your parents yeah. come oh yes um, well, um, we had a well, family. What was left of our family was essentially in New York. And so they wanted us to come and join them. And my parents gave me a choice. They said, look, you're, you're now 20, 21, etc. They said, do you want to come with us or do you want to stay in France? So by that time, I was wondering either I would become a teacher of English in France <laughs> or a teacher of French in the United States. And uh, I thought about the United States, of course. After the war, the American prestige was high. On top of it, I loved jazz and I loved <laughs> Negro spirituals. So, <laughs> so I thought, that might be a chance. Why not? And I did. Voila. <laughs> and Simon, the path that led you to Oberlin College Mm -hmm. where you taught French in the Peace Corps training program. Mm -hmm. And I thought you ought to see this and have it. But the folks in the audience might like to see oh. this bold mustache oh, I'll, on I'll Simone circulate. I'll circulate in it. the 60s. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, one, one, thing, one thing to follow up. One of my students in Oberlin took a job at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And uh, she saw an interview that the, uh, that the Holocaust Museum, Museum took with me. And she said that she discovered in that interview what I had not told her in, in Oberlin, because I didn't go around speaking about my previous life. <laughs> so. He was a very, very popular <laughs> teacher of French to <laughs> Americans who boldly and naively were going to French West Africa in the Peace Corps. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Any other question? Yes? I have a question about Strasbourg. Uh, my oldest son lived for a year in Strasbourg for his 10th year of high school. Mm -hmm. And their son came and lived with me in Vermont, and my other son. What was Strasbourg occupied? I mean, I don't quite understand that, mm. the color. Yes, I color. think 
I think that, in, in, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the Germans were at more or less cut off the eastern part of France, which they considered their territory that the French had taken away from them in previous wars or what have you. And in fact, in, in that region, they forced, forced some of the young men to serve in the, in the German army. Simon, um, with this, ex this intense set of experiences you had as a young man, learning that you couldn't trust many people and feeling enormous obligation to protecting other people who'd helped you and who were close to you, and other experiences that I don't know of. How's that affected you as you've been here in the United States? How's that affected your outlook on the world? <clears throat> I, I would say, <laughs> Believe in luck, mm -hmm. believe in luck, in person, personal luck. How can I say? You've got to work for it. It's not going to fall down on you, but it exists or, or you can believe that it will take you through all sorts of obstacles and difficulties, it seems to me. Um, there may be other lessons. I think it's funny. Uh, no, it's, you wouldn't be surprised. I think the job that we tried to do as volunteers in the camp, helping people that were worse off than we were, uh, that was something that has meant a lot. And um, when I think about it, um, I think it guides me in a way. It guides me through obstacles, through difficulties. Uh, that there are people that are worse off. And if you can help, yeah, I, I think I would, would let that guide me. Believe also in some luck, because we have been lucky, there's no question about it. So, that's about it now. <laughs> I may wake up in the middle of the night with another answer. You know you brought me great luck, Simon. Hmm? You know you brought me great luck. How, how? <laughs> well, uh, in 1972, when we were both teaching at Middlebury College, it was you who suggested that we go on a bicycle ride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that consisted of yourself and Victor Nuovo <laughs> and me. And uh, another wo a woman who was teaching named uh, Peg Strobel also. Oh. And we went on a four-day bicycle ride. And that gave me the idea to start Vermont Bicycle Tour. <laughs> that was great luck for me, too. Thank you. I've had wonderful years. I, I have 20 and more years of bicycling along the St. Lawrence in Quebec. I know. In beautiful landscapes and talking French. <laughs> um, and also, that river, that big river, is really something else. I mean, I don't know if, if you know, but if you follow the St. Lawrence, um, if you follow it, there comes a point. You have just left Quebec City, and you come to an island called uh, Ile Sainte Hélène. Just beyond the island, sea air. <laughs> you begin to the, the air is salty. It's it's sea air. It's come all the way from God knows how many kilometers away into into the Atlantic. It comes all the way to you. And you are in another world. 